start then. Yeah, if you're ready. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh -huh. Lecture four. The post has spotlighted uh, whatever. Okay, so last time I was talking about uh, random walks with internal or hidden degrees of freedom. And by then there were several questions. So let me uh, briefly run to this. So uh, what is a random walk with internal degree of freedom? So in the case of usual random walks, our state space is uh, a group itself. Whereas now we multiply our group by a certain other uh, set, which is called the uh, uh, Stay, uh, the set of uh, these uh, hidden degrees of freedom. So here the situation is very sim uh, similar uh, if one talks about topology, very similar to say considering uh, covering manifolds. Then of course there is fundamental group or deck transformation group, but uh, which is the skeleton, but there is also uh, the flesh attached to the skeleton, which is uh, the manifold itself. So here, uh, the situation is precisely uh, like this. And what one requires of uh, the transition probabilities is the same equivariance with respect to the action of the group. And therefore, if uh, I want to write the transition probabilities, so here, uh, transition probabilities from a pair of points, group element and an element from this uh, space of degrees of freedom goes to another one. Then uh, along the group, everything is space homogeneous. Therefore there, I will only be interested in knowing this increment each. That's why I'm writing these points like this. And then uh, therefore what happens is essentially the following. I can, uh, I have written uh, this expression already last time. So here mu of x, y is a collection of subprobability measures on the group. And it is convenient to look at the matrix which consists of these uh, probabilities. So that's a matrix whose entries are, uh, are sub-probability measures on the group. And then if instead of these measures, one uh, takes their uh, masses, their total variations, uh, then uh, this will be just a stochastic matrix. Matrix where the sum along uh, every row is equal to one. And then one can look at this uh, random walk with internal degrees of freedom in the following way. We perform uh, the Markov chain on this uh, space X, on the space of uh, degrees of freedom. But then uh, simultaneously with any jump there. So last time I was using an analogy with a, a giant uh, multi-story parking. So when we are moving from one level to another, from X to Y, we are also sampling an increment H, an element from the group, which tells us uh, where to move in the horizontal direction. Uh, and that's... Uh, 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 compound mark of change. So this, in a sense, can be done. So uh, space X at each uh, step uh, with uh, sampling and increment. And then we just take the products of these increments along the uh, trajectory of our mark of chain on X. So the result is our random walk. Okay, so one more uh, model, which I didn't mention last time is what is called two mark of random walk. Uh, that's uh, the situation when, uh, unlike in the uh, standard case, uh, the increments are not independent, but here increments, they form a mark of chain. And uh, well, one can really see, I will spare writing uh, formulas that this indeed can be described by uh, this model. So here, uh, the state space of this Markov chain is bigger than a group. There is more information which we need to describe our transition. Uh, we need the uh, previous increment. 
Okay, and then uh, Misha asked a historical question about the origin of this uh, notion. So I have looked it up and actually it turned out to be uh, more interesting than I expected. So actually first, uh, this model was introduced by a British uh, physicist, Geoffrey Ingram Taylor in 1922. And at that time he was actually well, although formally uh, Markov and Poya had already published by that time, but uh, it didn't really uh, communicate. Uh, and um, Taylor, he was quoting the work of Pearson, if I'm still allowed to mention his name, uh, who actually was the first to introduce random walks in 1905. That was, uh, essentially simultaneously with Markov or with uh, Einstein or with uh, Hardy. So there were a lot of people uh, doing simultaneously. Uh, then, uh, well, there was uh, some activity around it all the time. So there were works by Wishart, then Goldstein, a statistical physicist. Uh, and then, uh, a major boost was given by Sinai, actually, who in 1981 uh, resuscitated this model, and he was motivated by the uh, Lorentz gas. Because actually, he, uh, Sinai suggested two models, one uh, random walks in a random environment, and the other one, these uh, random walks with uh, internal degrees of freedom, which were uh, in a certain sense, approximating the uh, behavior of Lorentz gas. Okay, and then there were uh, Crumley and Sass, uh, one or two years later in early 80s, who uh, published several papers. Uh, they were inspired by, uh, well, they clearly acknowledged the source of the inspiration was Sinai. And uh, by the way, Misha asked about the Ising model. Uh, that was uh, among one of the uh, those uh, statistical physicists who were uh, dealing with uh, these uh, random walks. They were aware of the uh, Ising model. So, in particular, Wishart and uh, Goldstein were. Okay, so that's. Uh, okay, thank you, Vadim. Yeah. And then, well, I have to add that uh, that's actually not the whole history because uh, even after Sinai, it was reinvented uh, several times by various people. Okay, so now uh, let me shift to the uh, self-similar uh, part of the course. There is not much time left, but honestly, there is not much to say uh, either. Okay, so uh, let me uh, begin with in uh, and then uh, as usual uh, I can look at the space of all words in this alphabet and this space Okay, so that's finite words in X. And uh, these words uh, obviously form a tree, the root of this tree. So that's a rooted tree. So the root is uh, the empty word, then there is A. Let's see if there are only two letters A, B, and so on, B, B, and so on, so forth. Uh, so I uh, need this tree to be labeled so that I can really identify points of this tree, but I will also need uh, this tree as a geometrical structure because I'm going to talk about the uh, group of atomorphisms of the tree. So since uh, the tree is rooted, uh, it is endowed with a special vertex, the root, and therefore this is actually a uh, compact group, uh, which is uh, 
a limit of uh, how's it called pro finite group a limit of finite groups uh, now uh, what do I need about this group I need uh, its uh, self similarity which means uh, the following uh, so suppose I have an element from this group so an automorphism of the tree then uh, this automorphism uh, will give me uh, two pieces of information. So the first piece of information is the following. Uh, since the root is preserved, the first level is also preserved. And therefore, this automorphism will act as a permutation on this first level. Therefore, uh, I have a permutation of my alphabet X associated with this uh, automorphism. Okay, that's one invariant. And the second, uh, well, not invariant, well, I'm using this word too often, uh, one piece of information. And the second piece of information is uh, the following. So let's see, let's look at what happens here. So suppose, have I'm looking just at the first level and then I know uh, this is the information provided by this permutation sigma I know that any element from the first level of my tree goes somewhere on the uh, image tree on the image tree okay then it also means that the uh, subtree which grows from uh, my point, uh, will also go to the subtree, which will be growing from the image point. Okay? But then, of course, these subtrees, they're not moved, uh, they're not moved uh, intact. Simultaneously, something may happen inside this uh, subtree. And because of the self-similarity, of course, I can easily identify each of these subtrees with the whole tree. Uh, I just uh, erase the first letter. And therefore, I also obtain a family of elements of my group of automorphisms indexed by the points from the first level. In other words, indexed by my alphabet. Of course, uh, that's not, uh, and of course, uh, this information actually allows me to recover my automorphism. So these two pieces of information completely describe my automorphism. Okay, so, uh, there is a very convenient uh, symbolism uh, which allows us to keep uh, track of uh, these uh, two pieces of information. Namely, I am going to present these two pieces of information as uh, what I call generalized permutation matrix. Uh, so what is this? So first of all, here I have a permutation and it is well known uh, that any permutation can be presented by the associated matrix. So that's matrix which only has ones uh, where almost all entries are zero. So in each row and in each column, there is only one non-zero element, which is one. And that's uh, precisely how we describe our permutation. Okay, and now instead of this, instead of this, I will uh, slightly generalize this construction and uh, the entries of my matrix, uh, they uh, won't be zeros and ones. They will be zeros elements of my group. So once again, so I have, let's say permutation matrix in the simplest case, it's like this. And then instead of these two ones, here I will write the corresponding elements of the group of automorphisms. Let's say like this. And uh, of course, uh, 
in this way, I fully use uh, both pieces of information. So I take into account both the permutation on the first level and what happens on the uh, levels further down, which is presented by these uh, elements, Q1 and Q2. So this is what I will call a generalized permutation group. And of course, one can do uh, the same thing whenever one has an arbitrary group. So this will be what I denote by the uh, symmetric uh, group or generalized permutation group of a set X, but with the values in a certain group G. So that's generalized permutation group. Okay, and uh, so what I have described, what I have described is actually an isomorphism of the original group, the group of automorphisms of my rooted tree and the associated generalized permutation group. So now I can write this automorphism, uh, this isomorphism. And uh, this uh, isomorphism, in a sense, reflects uh, self-similarity, the uh, self-similarity structure, uh, which was first introduced by our uh, rooted tree. Okay, and now I can define uh, the notion of a self-similar. So that's actually not, uh, strictly speaking, it's not a group that is called self-similar, but rather it's, uh, the presentation of a given group is a subgroup of the group of automorphisms of a certain rooted tree. So now let me take a countable group G sitting in the group of automorphisms of my tree. And I will say that this group is self-similar. If, uh, if I apply this um, homomorphism, or actually isomorphism to the group G, then it will give me an embedding of the group G into the corresponding generalized permutation group. Oops, that's a plain key. Okay, so uh, in this, actually, it's very recent. So in this way, uh, it's probably was formulated by Mikrashevich or maybe by uh, Pink a bit earlier. Uh, and in a sense, it was really a revolutionary uh, discovery because this is a completely uh, a way of looking at groups, which is completely different from anything what was uh, known before. And in this way, it is very, very easy to present, to define a group, once again, in a completely orthogonal to the uh, presentation of groups which had been known uh, earlier. So let me, for instance, uh, in, describe in this way how one obtains the so-called uh, basilica group. Basilica group. Uh, it uh, appears very simply. So that's uh, the group which has two generators, A and B. And uh, in order to describe the group, I just have to describe this embedding, the image of this embedding in terms of uh, just for these two generators, A and B. So in other words, what I have to do, I have to assign to A the corresponding matrix of generalized permutation. And in the particular case of basilica group, it's just B0, 0, 1. So what does it uh, tell me? It tells me that the corresponding automorphism of the tree, first of all, it acts on the first level trivially, because if I, uh, forget the value of this group element, then I will see that this is just a trivial permutation. And then on the left half of my tree, it will be further acting as the transformation B and 
right half it will be acting as trivial transformation okay for b it is i also have to define the matrix and and this is uh, zero a one zero so what does it mean it means that on the first level the matrix uh, um, on the first level this uh, b acts by permuting two branches of the binary tree then simultaneously on the left one while permuting i will also apply the transformation e and i won't do anything on the right one or uh, one can do it uh, slightly uh, more uh, formally so how can one describe so here, first, I have a sign to A, this uh, two by two matrix, which tells me what happens on the first level. Okay, then if I want to uh, understand what happens on the second level, here I just have to substitute the letter B with the corresponding matrix. So here, therefore, I will have zero, A, one, zero, 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 Again, zero, zero, and one. And this will be a generalized permutation matrix, which tells me what happens on the second level of my tree. So that's a four by four matrix uh, in which, once again, if I replace all group elements just with ones, this will be a plain permutation matrix. And I can continue like this further and further, therefore, I know what happens on each of the levels of my tree. Therefore, I have defined an metamorphism of the tree. And in this way, it is very, very simple. Uh, in principle, here one can write uh, arbitrary permutations and arbitrary words in terms of the generators A and B. All these will define groups recursively, as I have just explained. But we don't really know much about uh, the groups which uh, appear here, except for uh, examples which are really, really uh, on the surface. Uh, on the surface uh, here actually can be given uh, strict meaning. If you look at uh, the arising generalized permutation matrices, then you will see that actually here there are not many elements which are not ones. Like for instance here, well, there is only one which is not one. And uh, one can count how many uh, non-trivial elements are in these matrices. And currently what we understand, we understand only the groups where this number remains bounded or uh, grows, let's say, linearly. So that's uh, as much as we uh, know. Okay, so why uh, is this group called uh, basilica group? What, what, do you mean, what do you mean by no? So there are no examples otherwise? So just you don't know how this... We don't group... know anything about these groups. But construct course, group... One can write examples very easily. Just take... Uh, anything. <laughs> anything you like. Uh, you, you can take arbitrary words and this will, give, uh, this will be a group. We don't know anything about these groups. So anything would be what kind of questions, like uh, amenability? Like amenable, uh, non-amenable, uh, let, let's say, uh, to begin with the most basic questions. But, but you know, people in group theory, well, there is a standard set of questions, so you can ask any of these questions and uh, there are no answers. Like growth, unknown? Don't think so don't think so no, not in this generality no no okay so uh, do i have to explain why it's called uh, basilica so why not you mention why not to do it here yeah. okay so why it is called basilica uh, because there is yet another notion which closer to uh, even closer to dynamics uh, this notion of iterated monodromy groups and this notion is very natural so suppose that we have a, 
a rational map of finite degree on the uh, Riemann sphere. And then uh, having degree D means that if we take a generic point, then it has D preimages. And each of these preimages uh, also has D preimages and so on and so forth. Therefore, uh, in general position, we obtain a homogeneous rooted tree of preimages. Okay, and now uh, what we can do, we can perform a monodromy, namely we can uh, move along a smooth path on our group and then well by continuity of course uh, these three will also be uh, traveling uh, continuously along this closed curve but then when we uh, return back when we return to our point of origin if uh, the uh, path is not uh, contractible, then of course uh, something may happen with this uh, tree. So that's a phenomenon which was first discovered by Columbus. Uh, no, not by Columbus, sorry, by um, uh, Magellan. Magellan, when he uh, returned after his uh, around the world trip. Uh, Okay, so uh, therefore, uh, this will give us a certain transformation, a certain atomorphism of our tree. And that's precisely uh, one of those atomorphisms about which I have been talking. And now one can take uh, concrete uh, functions, concrete functions. And in particular, uh, one can take for uh, f, f of z equal to, uh, so what's basilica, z squared uh, minus one. Yes. Huh? Yes. Yeah, z <laughs> squared minus one. And then, uh, well, if one looks at the group of all the atomorphisms of this generic tree corresponding to uh, various paths, then this will be precisely the group uh, which I have described, the group with two generators A and B, which has uh, this presentation, has this presentation. And actually these A and B, they correspond to a certain, uh, well, quite explicit uh, cycles on the uh, Riemann sphere. Just going around zero and around negative one, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's the uh, basilica group. That's the basilica group. And now um, how all this is related to uh, random walks. How all this is related to random walks. So let me uh, remind you that, so let's take a self-similar group. group, uh, which means that uh, we have this embedding of the group G into the uh, group of generalized permutation over a finite set X uh, with the values in the group G. And in particular, it means that for any element of our group, we associate uh, to this element the corresponding generalized permutation, generalized permutation. For permutation matrices, except for the entries, the non-zero entries are elements of groups. So there is natural multiplication, that's a group. Okay, and now uh, what happens if I uh, endow my group with a probability measure? So that's what one does if one considers random walk. What I obtain is therefore the following. I obtained the new matrix M mu, uh, which will be just the weighted sum of the matrices given by my self similar presentation. Okay. 
and uh, this matrix looks precisely like a matrix uh, which determines random walks uh, with hidden degrees of freedom. So here, namely, who are the uh, elements of this uh, matrix? Uh, the uh, elements of this matrix are uh, the uh, elements of in doubt uh, multiplied by certain coefficients. And of course, I can uh, interpret these sums or elements from the group algebra. I can interpret them as measures. I can interpret them as measures. So that's the matrix U, X, Y. That's a square matrix which determines a random walk with uh, hidden degrees of freedom. Uh, what is uh, the interpretation of this uh, random walk with hidden degrees of freedom? It's actually uh, quite uh, simple. So here, let me just look at the first level of my uh, tree. And then here, if I choose a point, if I choose a point and a transformation in the subtree growing from this point at the first level, then uh, what happens? Uh, if I apply an automorphism, if I apply an element of the group, it will move uh, elsewhere. So what will happen? So the point to which this subtree is attached will move to another point on the uh, first level and something will happen inside and something will happen inside. So here I have two parameters. So one is the point X and the other one is the group element G, which describes the transformation of this subtree or equivalently, since I can identify these subtrees with the whole tree, that's precisely an element of my group. So this gives me uh, my uh, random walk with random, uh, with uh, internal degrees of freedom. Okay, and now uh, what I can do, mm, I can do uh, the following uh, chain of transformation. So I start first with my original random walk driven by uh, the measure mu. Then I pass to this uh, random walk with internal degrees of freedom described by this matrix M mu. And then uh, what I can do, I can return back to my group. I can return back to my group, how? By uh, taking the trace of this random walk with internal degrees of freedom, just by restricting it. We lost Vadim again. I wasn't clear enough. Um, okay, <laughs> so, again. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let me then describe again the uh, Procedure. So uh, that's actually one uh, way of uh, approaching self-similarity. I will later uh, describe another one. So one way is uh, the following. So we start from a probability measure on our group. Then we pass to the corresponding random walk with internal degrees of freedom, the random walk which is described by the uh, associated matrix. And then we uh, look at the trace of this random walk on a single copy of our group determined just by one letter of our alphabet, which is uh, just one fixed uh, subtree of our tree. Okay, so uh, here, uh, this is uh, quite explicit. This is quite explicit and uh, I will uh, show how, for instance, it works uh, again in the case of the Basilica group. So for the Basilica group, we had A was equal to B001 and B was equal to 0A10. Uh, 
And now I will uh, be looking for uh, the simplest possible measures, gas symmetric measures uh, concentrated on generators. Okay, so I will use group algebra notation for simplicity. So I will be talking just about uh, convex combinations of group elements. Okay, so all this under the condition that two uh, alpha plus two beta is equal to one. So that's just another way to uh, present this measure. And then uh, therefore, what is the associated uh, matrix M U? So this is then what alpha times V zero zero one plus alpha times the inverse matrix, which is just B minus one, zero, zero, one, plus beta times uh, zero, A, one, zero, and plus beta times the inverse matrix, which is uh, what, which is uh, zero, one, A minus one, zero. Okay, so in other words, here, what do we have? So we have uh, uh, in the top left corner, we have alpha times B plus B minus one. Uh, here we have beta times one plus A. Here we have beta times one plus a minus one. And here we have uh, two alpha. Here we have two alpha. Okay, and now I want to pass uh, to this induced random walk uh, just on one uh, copy of my group. And you remember I had written uh, this formula at the end of the last lecture. Let me show this formula. It is here. So that's uh, what uh, is the governs the induced random walk, the trace of my original one on the X copy. So here, what you call induced random walk should have been called randomization for our seminar. True. Ah, oh, ah, it's <laughs> nice to hear. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> then we understand what you're okay, talking about. So, yeah, so here I remind you uh, what happens. So either I remain on this uh, level X from the very beginning, or first I go to a different level X bar. Then I do something outside of uh, my level X. So this is the sum of the uh, matrices in which from which I have removed the row and the column of X. So uh, all evolution takes uh, outside of X. And then finally, I have to return to X. So that's the uh, sure transform or sure uh, complement known in uh, linear algebra. Okay, and here you see in general, if I want to do something like this here, I have to invert a matrix. Uh, well, that's not a big deal because, uh, well, this inversion amounts uh, to taking, well, infinite sum of the powers. But uh, the problem is that if I start with a finitely supported measure, then this will uh, lead to an infinitely supported one, which will be difficult to control. So in principle, actually, it may work for infinitely supported measures, but uh, I think no one uh, looked at this. It's more difficult uh, technically. Now, if I return to our uh, Basilica group, then here you see uh, that uh, in one of the corners, uh, we actually have a scalar, a number. And therefore here, uh, it won't be a problem to take the inverse. The group won't be involved. It will uh, provide us just with a number. Uh, and therefore uh, it suggests uh, what to do when we want to find 
the uh, new measure, this measure mu x, the renormalized measure. So uh, this will be then uh, the following one. So this will be mu one, and this measure will be what? So mu one one. Then I have to take measure mu one two, which is the corresponding element of my uh, matrix, and multiply it by one minus mu two two to the power minus one. So, and it is here that it comes extremely handy that the corresponding matrix element is just a number. It's just a number. Uh, and then, well, I have to return back. I have to multiply by mu to one. So here one can do uh, this calculation explicitly. So what one obtains is the following alpha times B plus B minus one plus beta over two times A plus A minus one plus beta plus beta. Okay, so uh, this is again a probability measure. So everything works as uh, promised. And now we want to uh, look at the possibility to have self-similarity already for measures as simple as this, uh, for the measures described just by two parameters, alpha and beta. And then, uh, okay, what we uh, have to satisfy, we have to satisfy the following relation, alpha divided by beta, so I'm just taking the ratio of the coefficients with E and with B, uh, should be equal to the ratio of these coefficients in our new measure, which is beta over two divided by alpha, which gives us the equation that, uh, let's say two alpha squared is equal to beta squared. And the second equation, of course, is that two alpha plus two beta is equal to one. And uh, this system of equations very nicely has a solution. Let's say alpha not, beta not. Okay, now uh, what does it mean that we have a solution? Uh, it means that after these two transformations, we actually recover the original measure, but not quite. There is one more term here, it is this beta. Uh, but uh, this beta actually uh, helps us a lot because this is just a number. So it means that uh, this measure mu prime is just the uh, a lazy of my original measure. Namely, I dilute my original measure by taking its convex combination with the uh, delta measure at the identity of the group. Or uh, in terms of the random walk, it means the following. So the original random walk, it is an honest one. It moves somewhere at every step. You throw, you toss a coin and then you move. Whereas, uh, the new random walk, it's uh, more sophisticated. Well, uh, here the walker tosses the coin. Well, it tells uh, where to go, but actually before tossing this coin, before even tossing this coin, he uh, does something else. And this something else tells him whether uh, he or she, I should say, uh, stays at this place and just, uh, uh, has rest for one unit of time or performs a step of my random walk. So here the, uh, for the new random walk, the steps are interspersed with uh, randomly inserted uh, waiting intervals, waiting times. And it is because of the appearance of this uh, non-zero uh, lazy 
component in my map that it turns out that uh, the asymptotic entropy of this random walk will actually be zero. Uh, why uh, does it happen? It happens uh, for the uh, following reason. It happens for the following reason. So here I did uh, my chain of transformations. So I start from the original random walk, I pass to the uh, well, matrix valued or random walk with internal degrees of freedom, and then I pass to uh, this one. Okay, so let's see what happens with the asymptotic entropies. So we have here this chain mu goes to m u goes to u one. Okay, so let's uh, assume that here, uh, we have uh, a certain entropy h of g nu. So that's the entropy of our original random walk. Here uh, I will have the uh, new entropy, the new entropy, which will be, uh, which will be, okay, let me make sure I write this formula correctly. Uh, here I will have the entropy of the uh, random walk determined by this matrix M. And here I will have the entropy determined by my new random walk. Okay, and now uh, what happens? What happens, uh, so here, when I'm passing from the uh, matrix value random walk to the uh, new one, I just uh, rescale. I just rescale, and therefore, uh, this one is equal to d times the entropy of the original random walk. Uh, sorry, not the original, uh, the uh, new random walk, the new random walk. And on the other hand, on the other hand, here, uh, what what happens when I pass, uh, oh, okay, here I can just uh, write the inequality. Oops, sorry. Uh, so why uh, do I have this inequality when I pass from my uh, original random walk to the matrix valued random walk? Because uh, here what I do, I actually, uh, the matrix valued random walk, uh, that's, uh, it's obtained from my original random walk because uh, what do I do? I take my group elements and then I assign to them the corresponding matrices. So that's a group uh, homomorphism. And then the random walk consists just in multiplication by uh, the corresponding uh, increment uh, matrices. Okay, and then uh, how do we multiply matrices? We uh, multiply them uh, row by row. So when I do this multiplication, I multiply each row by the new increment uh, matrix separately. But therefore it means that each of these rows performs my uh, random walk with internal degrees of freedom. And there are D copies of them. And therefore uh, I uh, cannot uh, have more information in these D copies than I have the uh, information if uh, in the original random walk. Okay, now on the other hand, on the other hand, if I compare the uh, random walks, the original one and the one which I obtained after doing all this transformation, then I know that mu prime is a lazy version of my original random walk. 
And therefore, its entropy, okay, so I can write here, new prime is equal to, let's say, uh, T times mu plus uh, one minus T, uh, the identity of the group. And therefore, the entropy of uh, the lazy random walk, it's also obtained from the original one by rescaling. So it is just the entropy of the original one multiplied by this constant T. And finally, if I uh, compare all these inequalities, I arrive at the conclusion that the entropy of my original random walk has to be smaller than itself multiplied by uh, this uh, which is less than one. And before I conclude that uh, therefore, uh, heat up in the following way. So uh, we have used the contracting. And therefore, since it is contracting, uh, we have a numerical invariant, which is asymptotic entropy, which uh, therefore uh, has to be zero. Well, it's uh, pretty much the same as uh, in the situation when we have uh, iteration of a contracting map, iteration of a contracting map. So but, this- but should, should it be somewhere division by D somehow if you-, you yes, write... yes, yeah, I think there should be division. I have uh, been, okay, so- uh, So when you relate, yeah, the middle, I, the middle is the final. So. Yeah, I quietly expected that no one would pay, would pay attention. Yeah, but here I see that we multiply by d squared instead of uh, comparing. Okay, so how should it be? So it's uh, okay, u is less or equal than d times h of g m. Yeah, that's what I had written. And uh, d times h of g m uh, has to be greater or equal than h of G mu, and this is precisely the H of G mu prime. Yeah, I think now it's correct. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, well, that's a technicality, but the moral once again is that in this case, we used really very, very reduced uh, version of self-similarity just uh, contraction, just existence of a, a probability measure on the group which will, uh, on which uh, the entropy will be contracting under uh, these transformations. Uh, so uh, this uh, procedure uh, has been uh, applied in other situations, uh, slightly more general. So in particular, it was proved uh, that, uh, so what was it used for? It was used for proving amenability. So we establish uh, the fact that uh, the asymptotic entropy is equal to zero, which implies triviality of the Poisson boundary, the Louisville property, which in, terms, uh, in turn implies uh, amenability of the group. So that's uh, first was applied by uh, Virak and Bartoldi to the Bialica group. They did it uh, in slightly different terms. So they used a different formalism. Uh, then, well, this formalism with internal degrees of freedoms uh, was developed by me and then uh, we applied it together with Nikrashevich and Bartoldi for proving amenability of 
um, bounded activity automata groups. So that's the groups where the number of uh, non-zero elements uh, in these matrices uh, remains bounded always. So that's uh, quite limited actually, if one looks at it from the general point of view. Then uh, later uh, Virak with uh, collaborators uh, improved it and proved it for uh, linear growth automata. And that's apparently where it uh, stops because for a uh, high degree of growth, it uh, doesn't really work. So apparently there one can have random walks with uh, non-trivial boundary. Okay, but uh, since uh, here we are talking about uh, renormalization, uh, I uh, still want to mention another possible uh, way of understanding uh, self-similarity in this situation, which hasn't really been explored and which would refer to, uh, in my opinion, more meaningful situation where we would really have uh, self-similarity of boundaries. So that's what uh, would be uh, very nice to understand. So here, uh, let me uh, remind you the uh, setup. So we have our self-similar group which means that it is embedded into the uh, group of generalized uh, permutation over a finite set with values and g. So let me, uh, for simplicity, again, talk uh, about the case when there are just two elements here. And then uh, what happens is that inside this group, we have a diagonal subgroup. So that's uh, just uh, the uh, group of the matrices. So the generalized permutation matrices. And here I want these permutation matrices to correspond to trivial permutations. Therefore, well, there will be ones or rather non-zero elements only on the main diagonal and uh, two zeros otherwise. So this will be the group of, in other words, of entries uh, like this. Okay, and now uh, what happens is the following. So I can start with a random walk on my original group governed by a measure mu. And uh, from this uh, random walk, I will pass to uh, the induced random walk on its index to subgroup. So what is this index to subgroup? That's precisely this uh, diagonal subgroup. So, uh, which I can identify with the product of the group by itself. Okay, let me denote this measure by uh, mu tilde. And uh, of course, then I can further project this measure onto uh, each of the uh, factors in this product. And uh, here, uh, in principle, uh, one doesn't have to deal with uh, basilica group. One can deal, uh, for instance, with a group which is big from the very beginning. So instead of taking the group, uh, well, basilica group is generated by A and B. Uh, instead of this, I can take uh, just a free group generated by the same A and B. And there I will have precisely the uh, same embedding, which is uh, provided by these uh, basilica presentation. So let me write it again. So E goes to, okay, where does A go? So E goes to uh, B001 zero, zero, and B goes to, uh, zero a one zero okay but uh, here I can do it not in the basilica group but I can do it on the free group so that's one example or so that's uh, basilica for instance instead of basilica one can take the famous uh, Grigarchu group uh, the uh, it is famous because it's uh, first the example of a group of intermediate growth. And this uh, group also has very nice 
self-similar presentation. Well, that's uh, how uh, Rispetlav Lunch had defined it, except for uh, he didn't know at the time that it will be self-similar, but it, it was defined from the very beginning in terms of its action on a tree. Okay, so how is it defined? So there, there are four generators and what do we have? E just permutes uh, the first level without doing anything. B goes to A0, 0, 0, C. C goes to A, zero, zero, D, and D goes to one, zero, zero, B. So that's a Grigor tube group. And here, once again, instead of considering this as a self-similar presentation, can just look at this as a way to embed, let's say, free group with four generators into uh, its product by itself by using this uh, random walk inducing because we still have to pass to a, a subgroup of uh, index two. Or actually, since uh, all the elements here are involutive, then one can take, uh, well, the free group, uh, not the, uh, well, the free product of uh, two elements. Okay, and then uh, therefore I will uh, formulate the problem which is completely uh, open now uh, and we don't even uh, understand in which language uh, one has to formulate. So uh, we have this uh, diagram, we have this diagram and so potentially then we can look uh, again back a relation between these uh, new measures, uh, mu1 and mu2 and the original one. And uh, it would be nice to understand whether there are any self-similar phenomena at this level in this uh, language. So this would involve uh, real, uh, not trivial, real in the sense that, uh, well, measures with uh, real content flash on uh, the boundaries of the free group. So uh, therefore it would be uh, related with symbolic dynamics in a certain sense. But here it's uh, completely open and uh, I had mentioned uh, one of the examples. I want to return to it again. Uh, so what we don't understand is uh, for instance, the following situation which uh, doesn't even have to do with uh, these uh, self-similar presentations. So if just I look uh, measures on these product of two copies of let's say free group, uh, for instance, like this, diagonal plus direct product with, uh, let's say, with equal coefficients. Even in this situation, uh, I'm not aware of any understanding of the uh, resulting harmonic measures. So here, of course, the marginals of this harmonic measure will be uh, the uh, uniform measure on the boundary of our tree, which is uh, not a big deal. Depends with the interaction between these two uh, copies of our binary tree, or in other words, uh, what will be the uh, conditional measure. So if I fix one point at infinity in one uh, infinite tree, then uh, what will be the distribution of the points at infinity on the other tree? And this is uh, completely open. This is completely open. Okay, so uh, I think uh, that's it. Uh, well, once again, there was not much I could say about uh, renorm renormalization. However, I hope that uh, this whole setup will be of interest because uh, I do believe that it is really it really deserves to be looked at from the
Have you lost to Jim again? Oh. Mm. At the last moment. Yeah, just before the applause. Oh, okay. So you we lost you for a couple for a minute. Okay. Well, then can we proceed to questions? With him? You're still with us? So, Vadim, you're here? I think not like uh, Sputnik. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let Questions or comments? So, Vadim, this last piece, so can it be formulated directly? It's just some normalization procedure on the action of the group on the boundary, some kind of return maps, induced maps on the. Yes, yeah. Action. Well, it could be, but uh, it hasn't really been addressed yet. Yeah, yeah been addressed yet and i think this would be really more interesting because uh well in the basilica example uh what was renormalizing properly because the moral of that example is that in that situation uh, the only thing which uh, re renormalizes properly is uh, zero and that was the conclusion so the the, the entropy is zero and uh, with all the consequences but it would be interesting to have a really a kind of non-trivial example. Do you think you can always get a fixed point, some, somehow some contracting properties of this procedure when you pass and then have a fixed measure that is invariant? Uh, no, no. Uh, well, because you see in the examples when we were talking about uh, the uh, basilica group and all that activity, so there uh, what we are dealing with is actually a certain transformation on the space of probability measures. And uh, well, usually uh, there one is happy when one obtains just a finitely supported measure as such a uh, a uh, fixed point, but it's not always possible, uh, well, due to the uh, natural reasons. Uh, so that there would be infinitely supported measures uh, involved inevitably, but there, once again, it was, uh, to be honest, uh, I would say that there it was, well, this whole technique was used mostly as uh, a certain ad hoc uh, method. So, it works, uh, that's nice, but, uh, well, if... A vaccine, that's... <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I had a question for, for you, uh, which may be not so relevant for the talk, but I have some vague recollection that uh, Nick Varopoulos spoke about uh, more, uh, not, not uh, sort of finite support or uh, support of, of, of a transfer measure. If you have some very strong decay, at least, of uh, in the word metric of, of a measure, uh, exponential decay or something, then uh, I have some vague recollection that yeah, he uh, yeah. worked out, out this, but I'm not sure. Uh, it was a long, long time ago. Uh, well, it was in a, a different context uh, because, well, first of all, he was interested in uh, properties which are much more robust. So that's uh, what I call L2 theory. So he was interested in uh, uh, recurrence or things uh, related to Dirichlet forms and so on. So th that's much more robust. It's uh, stable with respect to uh, quasi isometries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Second, uh, well, here, here we are talking just about, uh, well, returning to this uh, pragmatic purpose, just about fixed uh, points of certain transformations on measures. Yeah. And the way these uh, fixed points are obtained, uh, are obtained is really, there is not much of a theory here. So we're just like, but our groups are such that these uh, fixed points can somehow be uh, obtained either because of the presence of uh, those uh, scalar entries in the corresponding matrices or because of the presence of uh, another instance when it is easy to invert matrices is when we have, uh, let's say, uh, finite subgroups inside. And then if we uh, have somewhere the uh, HAR measure, the uniform measure on, 
I shouldn't say Harry, it's finite group. Uh, if we have a uniform measure uh, on a finite group, then there it is also very easy to invert. Uh, so th things like that, things like that. So it's not, uh, I'm not really aware of any deep theory uh, looking for uh, fixed points of the arising uh, transformations. Uh, they're not that nice. Mm. Oh, of course, there, there are, uh, of course, if you co compare to Poisson boundary, Martin boundary, then there are very abstract constructions uh, to, to get the, 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 these measures, right? Uh, and this no, no, is, no, no, but no, it's no, not no. the same measures. <laughs> No, here it's just a very concrete uh, question. So that's uh, the formula. Okay, let me try to share screen again. Uh, it, uh, yeah, apparently I'm screen sharing. Okay, so let me find this uh, formula. Uh, so we're dealing, uh, we're talking essentially about this uh, transformation. So uh, how does it work? So I have a probability measure on the group. Then this uh, self-similarity procedure allows me to obtain from this probability measure a certain um, measure valued matrix, a certain measure valued matrix. So that's determined by my group. And then, uh, well, here you see, I have to uh, do this, uh, to take this uh, sure complement, I have at some stage take an inverse matrix, okay? And then uh, ultimately what I obtain will be a probability measure on the group. So I'm returning again to the original objects and I want this uh, new probability measure to be uh, somehow nicely related to the uh, original one. So that's uh, not easy to control. So what is the so what is this of the iterated monodromic groups for various say, quadratic polynomials? So you understand basilica more or less, you understand well, that's actually, that's a question to uh, rather to Valody Nikrashevich. Uh, uh, some, uh, some transformations have been understood very well and they give rise to nice uh, groups. And uh, for instance, actually one of those iterated monodromic groups, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, when one takes Z squared plus I, or, something yes, like this intermediate growth one yeah yeah one up uh, obtains an uh, intermediate growth uh, group which actually shows that this is really a completely different world because uh, still the uh, intermediate uh, growth group still they're quite pathological from the point of view of uh, traditional group theory they don't uh, occur there so easily uh, whereas here you see uh, just taking uh, instead of minus one i, uh, one obtains it essentially for free. So that's really completely different world. But uh, about the groups for uh, more or less general uh, rational maps, I don't really know. I don't know and I'm not uh, knowledgeable in this. But I think the AMG of polynomials, they have bounded representation. So therefore they are amenable. But uh -huh. the but the AMG, let's say, of a Sierpinski map, it uh, doesn't have a bounded presentation because the Julia set has dimension two. So therefore, it it does not satisfy the theorem. I mean, if if, if we are asking about amenability, or in general, or what if one asks not necessarily about amenability, but just, uh, can one say anything about uh, which groups can be obtained in this way? So, Dima, you are saying that polynomials, all of them are, not, are amenable? So, yes. this, this basilica result can be generalized to everything? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. For, for, for polynomials. So, they have bounded presentation. Ah. So, so, roughly speaking, for polynomial, you have a spider, and you look, by playing a little bit with the spider, you can obtain a bounded presentation of IMGs of polynomials. 
a boundary presentation in the sense that Vadim. Yeah, in, in the sense that Vadim said that uh -huh. there are only bounded uh, activity when yes. you consider big range, bigger group. But if you, if you take uh, our favorite Serpinski map, then a Serpinski map, well, the Julia said, uh, has dimension true topologically. So therefore, it cannot have a bounded presentation. What do you mean it has dimension two? So it cannot be separated by uh, a discrete set. I, I don't understand. Dima. So you're talking okay. about hyperbolic hyperbolic maps. So what what do you mean dimension two, or what? Well, uh, uh, well, I guess I guess I mean that it uh, it. I, I, yeah, it's not going to be dimension true, but I meant that it cannot be separated by uh, finitely many points. So, so if you take oh. two, two, two points in the Julia set of a Sierpinski map, then you cannot separate them by a, a finite number of points. So for polynomials, it is true. So if you take any two points in the Julia set of a polynomial, then the, there is a finite set of points that disconnects them. Mm -hmm. But for Sierpinski maps, that's not true. Okay. Okay. So this is an abstraction for bounded presentation. But I think, for example, for the airplane, so for the airplane, it is still unknown whether the growth is exponential or intermediate. So even for, mm -hmm. for quadratic polynomials, there are still open questions from the algebraic point of view. So Basilica has exponential growth dynamically. Well, well there is a dynamical interpretation, but for the airplane, it is still an open question. Yeah. I, I thought that these uh, intermediate groups uh, are very rare somehow. Um, with, with, uh, they, 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 are, they had to, it was hard to, re, uh, to construct them, like right? Grigor Chuk and so on, right? That was, so no, 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 it's not that it is hard to construct them. If uh, one uh, uses the right language, it's actually very easy. But the point is that uh, this language, in a sense, uh, was hard to uh, come up with. Mm -hmm. So they are not, uh, they are normal in some sense. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I think, that, I think that in the field of fractal geometry, in the fractal world, they are normal. So it's just, in yeah, the yeah, I, I didn't know. Smooth, for this classical smooth world, so they are, they are strange. Yeah, okay. But, uh, I didn't understand this. That's interesting. <clears throat> I have a question about the basilica group. So, is the other some? Uh, is it the only random walk with a, a trivial boundary? Is a trivial Poincaré boundary? Uh, I think it was proved that actually all, uh, let's say, symmetric random walks uh, do have trivial boundary oh. by Virag. And do they converge under the renormalization to this renormalization fixed point? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, they, uh, well, they discussed this uh, procedure, but uh, okay, I, I cannot answer it right now. Yeah. So you're talking about uh, random walks on, but for Basilica still? Or? Yeah, on Basilica, but with different uh, weights. Mm -hmm. Governed yeah. by a different measure. Whether this renormalization fixed point is attracting or repelling? Well, uh, this actually it converges uh, somewhere, and uh, then uh, this technique still works if uh, we don't have uh, a measure which is precisely self similar, but. Uh, uh, it is still okay uh, if we uh, just can control convergence to somewhere. Okay. So th then one uses uh, certain continuity properties of the entropy, things like that. In order once again to conclude that uh, ultimately the entropy is zero. Hmm. Other questions or comments? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.